Okay, folks, good morning or good afternoon. It's Jeff Salzman. Welcome to the Daily Evolver. It's good to be back with you on this Monday, October 6th, 2017. And today, uh, Corey, and Corey's here too. Hey, Corey DeVos. Hey, man. Happy St. Nick's. <laughs> yeah, same to you. Um, today, we're going to take a look at the tax bill that's coming down the pike from the Republicans in Congress. Uh, still in committee on some of the details, but we know the broad brush of it. And we'll see if we can put it in some integral context. Uh, to just cut to the chase, I see this tax bill as being one of the last gasps, <clears throat> speaking of which, one of the last gasps of the orange modern economy as it uh, sort of wine grinds into its late stage. And um, I'm actually bummed, I have to say, that it's happening. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, tax policy, it's, it gets very confusing for me. And, and I also uh, very sort of hesitant to make predictions and so forth these days, especially after Trump. But I don't think this is going to deliver on what its advocates promise. And I do think that it's probably, it's, well, it's probably going to hurt people. It's definitely going to hurt people if they manage to uh, get rid of the Obamacare mandate. And um, so, you know, that's the downside. Uh, the long range, of course, uh, in the spirit of evolution is beautiful, but not pretty. It may well hasten because it doesn't work. What I see is our inevitable movement into a more integral economy. Uh, and, uh, but let me just explain some of what I'm talking about here. When I talk about the orange or modern economy, um, that's really what came online here, really in some ways at the beginning of the United States. I mean, we, we really started out in a completely free enterprise kind of a system with private property rights and so forth, pretty much grafted in from the beginning. And the modern economy is based on private ownership of property and production. And that's, as I've often pointed out, an astonishing uh, evolutionary move uh, for humanity after a history of everybody being subject to the state. And, uh, and it was a very, very fruitful system. Um, it's grown over these couple hundred years and, um, you know, it's over succeeded in a way. Um, the, the, the basic uh, purpose of a modern economy is growth. It, it's the creation of material wealth. And it has done that. It has created wealth unlike the world has ever seen. We have tripled lifespans. We have the indoors. We have plenty to eat uh, for the most part. Huge numbers of people. That's an amazing feat. Uh, but the downside is, is that a couple of the other sort of rules of the game, such as that the number one mission of a company is to maximize return to its investors. You know, that is the system. That is what all these companies, all private institutions are trying to do. And the problem with that is that over time, it concentrates ever greater wealth in ever fewer hands. And um, so that's sort of the modern economy. And, and, and I want to point out that grafted onto that modern economy is the green or postmodern economy, which is based not on growth, but sustainability. And it's also based on fairness and distribution so that people who have been left behind and, uh, you know, people who are outside of the system of this, you know, wealth creation machine are taken care of. And that really started big time in the 40s with the New Deal and child labor law laws and, and that sort of thing, where um, you know, the welfare state started coming online. And it really gained momentum in the 60s and continues to grow, has continued to grow uh, until now, possibly. Um, in fits and starts, certainly. Uh, and we have an ever greater safety net. Now, this orange and green, this modern and postmodern sensibility or worldview, uh, I think, as we have established many times on this show and in integral theory in general, 
uh, they don't like each other. And, um, and they fight against each other. And the, um, the, the people on the left have sort of a natural antipathy for the corporate side of the street. And the people on the right have a natural antipathy towards the bureaucracy. They both see them as being the enemy, basically, of these big out of control forces. And so, you know, we sort of fight our way forward. And in this tax bill, the modernist Republicans, the, 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 the orange modernist economy has, has clearly won. And it is sending more money into the hands of the people who own and run the economy. It's as simple as that. And, you know, owning and running the economy is, uh, was like, like I said, that was an amazing thing that private people could do that. But now, um, you know, the hope is that the productivity or the, the, the increased wealth that is created will trickle down into the pockets of the Congress people who serve them. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the hope is that it will trickle down into the economy to help everybody. And, you know, trickle down economics is widely derided on that liberal side of the street, on the postmodern side of the street. But in fact, it's worked. Uh, the, the rising tide of economic growth seen after World War II indeed lifted all boats uh, until it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, one of the problems. I'm going to show a graph. I'm not going to do too many graphs because, like I said, I get confused by the numbers. I'm looking at the big trends here. But let me just show you this one graph because it's really pretty stunning. It's from, um, let's see, Bloomberg. So, you know, part of the uh, oligarchy. Uh, and, and this is the, uh, shows the... Um, uh, the increase in output, the, the increase in productivity is this blue line. And the increase in the real compensation of workers per hour is in this line. And you can see that after World War II, starting in 1947 here, they grew evenly. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, they, they say on the, the title of the slide, these two were supposed to be inseparable. And the productivity and the compensation grew roughly at the same rate until, you know, the big tax cut in the 80s, which I remember very well. And, and then the, the productivity started going more into the hands of the owners than the workers. And we can see that through 2007. And the statistics that I saw from Robert Reich, now he's a partisan and whatever, but you know, he was also the labor secretary. He's a smart guy. He's, he showed that 95% of the economic gains since 2009, so that's about eight years ago, um, since the recovery after the Great Recession, since the recovery started, that 95% of the economic gains since then have gone to the top 1% net worth. So that, and you can see that here, that this really just leveled off here and it continues to spike here. So um, that is untenable. You know, there's just something about the collective intelligence of, you know, we've always had it. That's part of the human condition. It's part of our reality is that we have an individual and we have a collective intelligence. They're at a certain polarity. And politically, they're at a polarity for sure. But at some point, the collective says that's untenable. And the problem is, I think I said a minute ago, the, the it, modernity, in a sense, worked too well. Um, let's remember that a modern economy is about the creation of material wealth. That's what it does. It, and, and we got very good at it. The material world, human beings have mastered the material world in many ways. And some people are very, very good at it. So... In our world where all the information is available to us and we have all sorts of intelligence working on it, uh, machine and human, we have created what one commentator called a super sorting system. And I, I love that because it shows us um, when you get this, this machine of intelligence, this worldwide machine of intelligence working, that, you know, 
the, the, the payoff to these elite players just becomes astronomical. And so we have, um, you know, Jeff Bezos, who last week became the first person ever with a 12 digit net worth in the United States, $100 billion. Uh, we have Elon Musk, the first man in history to create $4 billion corporations, different corporations. Uh, we have uh, Larry Merlo, another interesting uh, member of the 0.001%. He's the head of CVS Pharmacy. And he gained notoriety a couple of years ago for enjoying the widest gap in the country between the CEO salary and the average salary of their workers. He made over $12 million in a year, and his average employee was paid $28,000. And I see that now he's getting another $55 million bonus for the acquisition of Aetna Insurance. So, you know, is he worth it? Well, CVS shares have risen 116% since he took over. Um, and, um, you know, he's also has some good things on his side. He's the guy who banned tobacco. He lost $2 billion a year in sales from banning tobacco, but he wants the brand of CVS to be, you know, uh, what Jim, Jim Cramer calls him, a great visionary of the home healthcare market, of the new healthcare market. So, you know, these guys, if, if the only thing that matters is the bottom line, then they are worth it. Yes. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan has a, a, a salary of $1.4 billion. Adele, 29 year old, she's been singing for five years. She's worth $150 million. She just signed a contract with Sony for another $130 million. These people generate the income. An elite player in business who can actually change a, corp change a battleship of a corporation in the system where the only bottom line is the bottom line is, yeah, they're worth it. You know, Jeff Bezos, fair and square. So that's, but that's the part that is beginning to uh, uh, not square with more and more people. And it's, it's part of this just sort of great polarity that I mentioned, I think, earlier, uh, just between the individual and the collective. And, you know, at some point we start asking, are more poor people getting out of poverty? Does everybody have some reasonable health care? Is there a way forward for people who don't want to go to college and who want to work with their hands and make a decent living like my dad and all my uncles and all my friends' dads and moms did? Uh, is there a way for people who do want to go to college that they can go? And, you know, that just sort of naturally, that pendulum swings back. And if we look at human history, that, that pendulum's always been swinging. We see that the, the human project is about creating a more safe and prosperous world for ever more people. And every stage of development from tribal to warrior to traditional to modern to postmodern and, and the emerging integral uh, has done that. You know, and again, it's not always been pretty, but uh, every stage creates that a new way of creating and distributing the wealth of the culture. Hunter gatherers, horticulture, agriculture, industrial information. And what is working is this, in, this enduring tension, this, this sort of, uh, what does Steve McIntosh call it? A, um, it's just a polarity that just exists in reality is a good word for it. But, uh, and that's this t tension between the individual and the collective. And um, I think that as we move forward, uh, an integral sensibility is, is coming online where we really want to have the best of both. You know, where we want to have not just a classical kind of socialism, and bureaucracy, build around a bureaucracy. Uh, and we don't want to have just this wild free market that's just at this point is tuned to throw way too much rewards up to the top. Um, 
And, and, and we have a certain schizophrenia about that that I think is actually a, a symptom of an emerging integral consciousness. And let me explain what I mean with you know, my own sort of schizophrenia around the issue. You know, the, the, the left part of me and the left part of, the, of all of us and, and of the system, the collective system, wants to make sure that everybody's taken care of, that we have a decency you know, we have a, a, a certain baseline beneath which nobody will fall. That was the impetus around the New Deal. We didn't want to see old ladies selling apples on the corner anymore. A modern society required that people get up and move from their hometowns. They wanted their parents taken care of. They want some sort of a basic safety net. But the right uh, has always resisted that. There are people on the right who still basically, they're about dismantling the this, this safety net starting with the New Deal. That, was, that would be what they want. And they have a piece of the truth in that they are concerned about basically free riders. You know, that we can't make people be dependent on the system. And when we do, we don't do them any favors. You know, we create this a whole culture of dependency. We create a bureaucracy that is uh, like all bureaucracies, like all organization, is tuned to its own self-preservation and growth. And so that's the, the sort of fear for the right. And, uh, and, you know, we keep these in balance. I think that the pendulum swings, but the clock moves forward. And we have ever, you know, greater... Uh, uh, both productivity and taking care of people. Uh, but this tax bill is, a, I think, a bad swing in the wrong direction. But at any rate, uh, I, I, I saw this come clear to me. I think it was it yesterday morning. It might have been. It was yesterday or the day before. So I was out running errands, and I went to Whole Foods to get some breakfast. So they have this big breakfast buffet. And I filled my container with um, quinoa and oatmeal and fruit and nuts and yogurt and all of this good stuff. And I took it over. They have this nice dining section. This is one of Whole Foods' big mothership stores. And I sat down and I'm eating. And I look over and I see that uh, next to me, uh, uh, one chair down, is this guy. And, you know, he's, he's dirty. He's... Um, got his clothes are dirty. He's got these great big bags of stuff piled around him, and he's got a sleeping bag and backpack. And he's typing away, his scraggly hair is hanging there, and he's typing away in an old clunky PC. And he's all plugged in. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, here he is eating at Whole Foods. And I, you know, feel a little mad because I'm eating my $16 breakfast at Whole Foods is what it was. And I'm tired of these people who are always hassling me for money, you know, and every, you know, this is a problem in Boulder. Boulder is such a great town that all the people come, the travelers, they call themselves, and they um, are at every corner and, you know, every, whether I'm walking, whether I'm driving and I'm just, you know, so I have this whole sort of reaction to this guy. And then I look down and I see that he's actually not eating at Whole Foods. He's eating at Whole Foods. He's, he's using their table, but he's eating a can of Hormel beans, which they don't sell at Whole Foods. And it's, you know, they're just sort of cheap from one of the grocery stores. And I, he's got the Whole Foods sriracha sauce that he's sort of pinched and he's having some of that. And, um, and then my heart breaks, and, 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 I, and, and I, I have, you know, I realize that there are people that are actually not really capable of taking care of themselves in the way that we think people need to be taken care of. And this is just one of the sort of moral dilemmas of this idea when we, of where we have a safety net, and how do we deal with free riders? And I've come to the conclusion that there is a certain group of people who they're going to be free riders. You know, they have a sort of, some of them have what I would consider to be sort of a, a disorder of volition. They are smart, they can carry on a conversation, they know a lot, some of them are well educated, but they can't sort of get off the couch and get moving. And, um, you know, that's not just uh, uh, situational. It's part of their makeup. 
And, uh, and then, of course, there's just the people who are adventure. They, 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 uh, the Woody Guth Guthrie types, they're just, you know, this land is your land and, and they're out living on the land and they don't have any of the constraints of society. And there's something about that that I, I appreciate. So, you know, I have this sort of, um, um, like I said, schizophrenia about it. And, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, but, but here's, here's the good part is that the, the beat goes on people and, you know, the integral economy is coming and we can actually see it. Uh, I, I, I heard on Morning Joe this morning, there's a guy come on, he wrote, did a study at Harvard on millennials. And millennials, of course, the pe people born after uh, the year 2000. And it's, uh, as of 2018, they'll all be 18 at a minimum. Uh, they will be the largest voting group um, uh, in, in the country. And they are, they'll be larger than the baby boomers. And they're not at all happy <laughs> with politics as is currently played. Uh, two thirds of them are fearful about the future. Um, and uh, less than half of them care about the um, political parties. I think 40% identify as Democrat and 30% identify as Republican. Uh, but um, they, it's more radical than that. Uh, Michelle Goldberg, which is, who's one of the new columnists in the New York Times, wrote a column last week called, No Wonder Millennials Hate Capitalism. And she talks about a survey that showed, and I'll quote here, 44% of millennials would prefer to live in a socialist country, compared with 42% who want to live under capitalism. For older Americans, the collapse of communism made it seem as though there were no possible alternative to capitalism. So I'll say that again. For older Americans, the collapse of communism made it seem as though there were no possible alternative to capitalism. But given the increasingly oligarchic nature of our economy, which is what I'm talking about, it's not surprising that for many young people, capitalism looks like the God that failed. And let me just pause on that God that failed thing. That drives me crazy. This is what drives me crazy. Uh, it, capitalism did not fail, it has not failed. What it's done is its job and it's time to move forward. So, you know, I just want to reframe that a little bit, the God that failed. Anyway, uh, yes, it's failing now and it needs to move forward and that's how it works. Um, and, um, and I think we're seeing that, um, you know, as the younger generation comes online, that the um, uh, the next direction is queer uh, is clear, <laughs> and that is we're all, just all going to become Danish. Um, there's going to be some um, mixed economy uh, where you know we have the best of the individual side of the polarity. That is the initiative, the creativity, experimentation, the willingness to fail, to move forward, you know, all of that good stuff. And also the characteristics of the collective side of the street, where we are taking care of those who are less fortunate and providing a basic level of security for everybody. And I do think that's where we're going. I thought it would, I was hoping it would be a less bumpy ride. Uh, and I and I am bummed. I gotta say to see this, um, you know, what really just feels like um, stale, old thinking. I mean, I, I listen to the people. I, you know, I try to have an open mind, so I listen to you know the Orrin Hatch and these, these guys who are really all for it, really, you know, pushing it and the big believers for it. And when they explain how it's going to grow the economy and raise wages. It just doesn't, you know, it just falls flat for me. And actually, I'll just end by reading uh, a little bit from this one um, column by Todd Carmichael, and he's the co-founder of uh, and CEO of La Colombe Coffee, Coffee. And it's a big coffee company. And he's talking about what, uh, uh, what other CEOs will tell you. And that this is a, he writes, it's a half billion, 
billion, half trillion dollars of corporate tax giveaway by the GOP, which isn't going to create a single job. And every CEO knows this, but won't tell you. A tax break for their company simply means a fatter bottom line. Not jobs, not investment, just more money in the pockets of folks like me. Um, let me see. A stimulus clearly falls within the sort of cuts one might expect when the economy needs to be goosed. Typically, when investment cash supply is low, when interest rates are high, or the stock market is slumping or tumbling. But what every CEO knows, but will not tell you, is that the reverse conditions are actually true. This is not an economy to goose. If anything, the present business landscape is red hot and overstimulated. Cash and capital are flowing heavily with unprecedented amounts of money looking for a home for investment. Interest rates are extraordinarily low and the stock market is a top row nosebleed highs. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, sort of bummed here and, um, uh, and, 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 and hey, Corey, man. Hey man. I wanna hear what you have to say. You're yeah. sitting in another seat. Uh, in this uh, bus. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, th I mean, this is, this is kind of terrifying. I mean, just to sort of uh, personalize it for me, you know, I, I have a daughter who received a liver transplant uh, when she was one and a half years old. She's doing amazingly well. It's, it's been a miracle to, to see her recover, but you know, we're on the private insurance market. Um, Integral Life isn't a big enough company to offer in, uh, employer-based healthcare. So we're on, the, we're on the, the private market here in Colorado. And, you know, one of the big issues with this tax plan is they're, they're getting rid of the mandate. And the mandate is the, you know, by far the least popular aspect of the uh, Affordable Care Act, but it's the only piece of the ACA that actually made the math work, that actually allowed for the protections of pre-existing conditions like that that my daughter has. So, you know, right now we're, we're waiting to see whether or not uh, we're approved by Medicaid again this year. Hopefully we will be because, um, you know, otherwise we're paying literally $1,000 a month for her anti-rejection medicine, which is not covered by any insurance in Colorado. So it's terrifying. And then when I hear news, you know, when I hear even Marco Rubio admit that you know, basically, if you're if you're in your 40s right now and you're looking forward to Social Security, eh, don't get too far ahead of yourself. And many others have admitted that Medicaid and Medicare are next in the chopping block. And this is, you know, sort of the old cynical conservative move of starving the beast, um, you know, bring those tax revenues down so low so that you create the illusion that you have no choice but to cut all of these New Deal welfare programs. And but, but of course, they never really do. Uh, until now, yeah, maybe. That, that's right. I mean, this may be the really first time of, of actually doing it in a way that um, we'll see what kind of results come yeah. from it. Yeah, and you know, when, when you were uh, sending me a couple chats before the show, I really liked your framing. I, I appreciate your framing of, of this as a dying gas. And in a lot of ways, that's, that's what this is. That's what makes this as cynical and as dangerous as it really is. is that this is, this is, in a lot of ways the very last chance that this current formulation of the right has to pass their wet dream of, of a tax bill. Yeah. And, um, you know, so in the short term, it's, it's terrifying. And I think we have legitimate reason, you know, to be unnerved by this. In the long run, um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some pretty exciting opportunities here. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, the millennials, just a brief correction, the millennials are the generation who uh, were starting with the early 80s who came of age around the millennium. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. So, so now they are of voting age. Yeah. And the youngest not, ones are now of voting age, the ones right. born in 1999 or that's 2000. That's right. And exactly. And with this last cohort coming online, now they're the most popular voting block. And, you know, Previous in previous elections, uh, you know, the voting block was least likely to turn out. I, I know that's about to change in a major way. So I think that look, I mean, you want to talk about a dying gas uh, between this text, this this tax plan, between the almost inevitable repeal of net neutrality, which is something millennials care deeply about, uh, 
with you know Trump's overall incompetence and possibly corruption, uh, with you know the GOP doing stupid shit like getting behind Roy Moore. I mean, you know, at this point when our our country is as radicalized as it is, our that pendulum is no longer a pendulum; it's a wrecking ball, and it's doing some serious damage right now. I'm going to make the case that this wrecking well, first of all the the wrecking ball is going to come swinging back in the other direction so i think that as a integral independent socially liberal pragmatist incrementalist i mean whatever other buzzwords you want to wrap around that use um <laughs> this is going to be a very good thing it, ultimately in the long run this is going to be a very good thing because what's going to happen is this makes 2018 you know the big blue wave that everyone talks about in 2018 that we already see finding traction uh, in, in, in many local polls around the country, if that blue wave comes, you know, really comes in full force, then what we're going to see is the liberals are going to be the ones responsible for all the redistricting in 2020, when we can start actually dealing with the conservative gerrymandering that's, that's you know, that they've ridden into office over the last yeah. 10 years or so. This, I mean, and that will be the dying gasp of not the GOP, but this current incarnation of the GOP. Yeah. And that's actually something to look forward to. I just, you know, there's gonna be a lot of damage between now and then. And I'm just hoping and praying that, you know, for me personally, that my family's not caught in this in this fallout. Yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously many other families, you know, we're yeah. we're tapped into a network now of exceptionally vulnerable families. Um, you know, the Republicans haven't even uh, renewed CHIP, the children's health insurance program. Yeah. And no, it's, it's, it's something. It, it, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd argue a little bit that some of the, that they're cynical in the sense that some of them believe this. You yeah. know, they really do believe that this sort of radical dismantling of the state and uh, everybody takes care of each other is a better way to go. And, um, and, 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 you know, it, it, it even goes back to the dawning of democracy, where the arguments against democracy is you can't have people voting for their leaders because they're going to vote for the leaders who give them stuff. Mm -hmm. And so people are going to vote all the benefits for them, you know, to themselves. And that's actually been proven to be true in a way, because we have a deficit that's, you know, 14 to 15 billion dollars. This is going to add another couple billion or trillion dollars to it. Uh, but, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, that's that's all good. Yeah. Because we actually did want people to be taken care of. The modern system creates so much wealth that um, you know, at some point, how many tens of billions of dollars do you really need? Yeah, that's right. You know, and 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 there is a, a again that collective side comes back online. And, and it almost goes back to that, in fact, it does, it goes back to that line that Obama was pilloried for, where he said, he was talking about a small business person or whoever, and he, he was talking about, you know, they use the roads, they use the courts, they, they didn't build that, you didn't build that, and of course the right ran with that, that, you know, you didn't build your company, the, the government built your company. No, they're both, yeah. you know, that there is a sort of a, there is a collective ownership of the of the of the civilization of, of yeah. the society that has to be taken into account okay. i mean these people and you know i know a lot of them i've benefited from it myself the system uh is so great that you can get in there and and, and, and you can make all kinds of money with and and actually uh not support the system commensurately. That's right. And that, that, that's what has to change. Yeah. And I know, think that will change. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it will too. Um, again, this is adding evolutionary pressure. This is, this yeah. is, this is just fuel for Eros, you know? Um, you know, and one of the, one of the other sort of framings that I, that I use for this is you know, during our crypto uh, currency talk with Ryan Olke a couple months back, we were talking about sort of the evolution of scarcity, right? And how, the original scarcity of the human race was food until we hit the, you know, the agrarian revolution where the scarcity became land. And then we ran out of frontiers and each plot of land was capable of growing enough food. So the, so land was, you know, no longer seen as the, the, the primary scarcity became capital. 
Well, now we're at the point in the evolution of scarcity where the real scarcity is the attention economy. And what I see happening, and this is, you know, this is where I sort of get um, a little bit cynical and a little bit scared. What I see happening is, is plutocratic interests using the attention economy to create the illusion of a scarcity of capital that's actually not there. There is no scarcity of capital. This country has, as you mentioned you know, earlier in your show, this country has a ton of wealth. Yeah. It's just not being utilized. It's not being wielded in a way that is a, is a, is a benefit to the whole. Yeah, I've never understood, you know, uh, the, the, uh, there's an argument uh, from the economists on the left is let the money flow to the people who are actually going to go out into the marketplace and spend it. That's right. That's you right. Know? Yeah, and, and, and that's how you goose an economy. No, that's right. You know, Do you remember how to get to the top? Yeah. Do you remember so George Bush? It made sense to me. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a ton of. I mean, do you remember George Bush's? Everyone made fun of him for it. But remember when George Bush sent out like five hundred dollars? That that was the, you know one of his stimulus programs. That is actually far more. Everyone made fun of him for it. Right. It's actually a far more effective way to stimulate right. an economy <laughs> because it yeah. creates. You give money to poor people, they're going to spend every penny of, exactly. of that money. Yeah. And, that, you know, demand is what increases jobs. Demand right. is what raises wages. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, not, not somebody not, having another zero on their, you know, statement every month. That's right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like we're just pretending Kansas isn't a thing, right? Yeah. They've, they've tried this approach with Kansas, and it was, you know, disastrous. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, well, let's, you know, that, that's the problem with Trickle Down today is that it's largely a belief system that yeah, doesn't have right. a lot of math behind it. No, it does. I mean, as I was saying, even as I hear them argue for it, I don't, you know, maybe they are cynical, you know, I don't know. But uh, well, I, my, 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 there was something to believe in at one point, and it's just overshot, yeah. you know, it, that's the, the way of things. You know, it, people, it, they exceed with their success, yeah. and there's a correction, and Boy, this is, yeah. this is one. I find myself quoting uh, the big Lebowski a lot. You know, I say, you know, liberals, you got to stop calling these guys Nazis. They're not Nazis. They're nihilists, dude. Say what you will about the tenets of national socialism. At least it's an ethos. Yeah. I'm not seeing much of an ethos here. Well, <laughs> I'd argue that, but we'll, we can do that another day. But yeah, uh, so anyway, a uh, lot to to think about. And of course, we'll see how it actually unfolds here in the next couple of weeks. Presumably it's going to happen. So, yep. all right, my friend. Well, thanks, Corey. Yeah, thank um, you, man. Thanks for uh, making this available to me and to us, this Daily Evolver daily thing, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays on Integral Live. Thank you for making Integral Live happen. Thank you for making Integral Life happen. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, let's see. We're going to be sending out uh, an email soon that's going to allow people to purchase webcasts for the What Now event at the end of the year. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I think we're selling those for uh, $125 for the full event, which includes downloads of all the, the sessions and all that. Uh, and that'll be $100 for members of Integral Life. So if you become a member today, uh, that'll save you 25 bucks on the uh, webcast. And uh, I'm also going to be sending out an email soon that allows people to purchase Integral Life gift certificates. So if you want to give the gift of Integral membership or one of our courses or something like that, uh, this will allow you to do so. So stay tuned. And I was thinking about that. You know, that's a great idea. Um, the Integral Life membership as a gift. Yeah. Because uh, for, for the right person, that would be a really terrific gift. Somebody who's really interested in Integral, somebody who's really interested in, you know, evolution, uh, as it, you know, arises on the ground. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good move. Yeah. All right, gang. Well, thank you so much for listening and watching, and we will see you back here on Friday for the next Daily Evolver. Take care. Bye, guys.